I'm going to be talking about the Barnes and Hill in this, uh, the eighth annual Barnes and Hill. Okay, so we're going to do that. Um, I have a slide. I'm going to be a little bit longer than Bob. And that, uh, I have two announcements. One, there's a barn tour in Alexandria, New Jersey, and Huntington County. If anybody wants to go to that, it's October 12th, Alexandria, in Port of Palm Township, I believe, and Huntington County. So that's October 12th. You can Google it. I don't have a, a website or anything, but you can Google that. There's also going to be a tour of the northern third of the log houses on the, in Lehigh County on the same date. So I can't be two places. I've been asked to speak there. So October the 12th, um, the Hibble and Jal uh, Preservation Society is going to have that. And they're based in New Milford. If anybody wants to know that, you can order tickets. I think it's kind of 12 hours or something like that. It's kind of a unique thing. And that's about it. Okay, this is the um, only stone barn uh, of the excluding the wall time barn right outside the door here and the uh, remnant. This is the only stone barn on the property on the tour this year. Okay, this is a, as it stands now, with the stone repeat stone barn. Wider, but that's a really wide front straw shed built in the 19 in the second decade of the 20th century. Here we have you have to look closely. Here we have a, a, a semi-unique situation where we have a brick floor 10 feet out and 36 feet long in front of I, I guess three stable doors here. In front of the of three of the doors are also stone stepping areas. They're not really thresholds. But there's stone stepping areas. So these are, these are stone, and the rest of this whole paved area, paved area, not paved area, but masonry area, call it, is a brick, okay? We're inside the barn, of course, now. Here is the, some of the timbering that we see. Here is the roof structure. There's dozens and dozens of milled rafter pairs here. And we have a clean post. Now, this barn, again, 
bill of circa 1915, it would only make sense that you would have a candid pearl in the plate. I've said that a number of times, Bob has said it too for the past years, that that's a, date, a general diagnostic dating tool. You don't normally see this before about 1830 or so, but there can be a few exceptions here and there. These are the overden beams, of course, and over these were, still, were placed boards and above that corn crops, okay? And here's more of the overden, all right? This is it, we're now in the basement. Look at this, now, there's two summer beams here, but this is a summer beam. I showed this to people on Thursday evening. This is an interrupted summer beam where there's no splice. So many of these summer beams and so many of the barns have splice summer beams where the where their scarf joints or splices join end to end on the summer. Here it's interrupted. And the first one that I ever saw was Captain Merrick's barn just outside of Springtown. Okay? This is another uh, section of the basement where we have a uh, major trough that is actually longitudinal in the barn. Cows have major troughs that were transversely set and just the opposite for the horses. The horses, of course, were set 95% in our area, in the valley, in the Southern Valley, in the Lehigh Valley, at the house side of the barn. There's no exception to this barn. This is the Overly Barn. I don't know if I mentioned that before. And the house is built about 1820, okay? This is our second barn on the tour. I want to go back. You don't have to go back, Patrick. But the last, uh, the stone barn here has a wonderful stone barnyard wall. So don't take that in. Bob will be at that barn, I think. And uh, to take that in, it's about 100 feet long. It has some very interesting features. This is our second barn, the official frame standard barn that was built in 1850. So many of the frame standard barns on today's tour were built anywhere from about 1850 to 1880. This barn is unique for a three-day barn. There's about 210 barns that have shown their faces so far that have principal rafter systems, the kind of system that you saw, the roof system that you saw when Bob's taught in England. Here you have a three-day barn that has six principal rafter pairs. Next one. This is the uh, overhead, I'm sorry, this is the pilot door, the original covered door. There's a fertility sign. Kunzman's name is part of the uh, lineage of the land ownership, and here's a PK, okay? Here we're inside the barn, of course, and look at these really big uh, marriage marks. There's twice as big as many of the barns have. Let's go to the next one. No, go, go back. Sorry. Now here we see part of, part of a principal rafter system, okay? Here's one at the end wall. And here's another one. There's six here. There's one in line with each frame, each bent, and, and one at the midway point in each end bay or mouth. Okay, so this is the only three-bay barn that has six principal rafter pairs. There's four bays, four bay barns that we've seen, that's F-O-U-R, bay barns that have five, sometimes six, but this is the only one, this is the only three-bay barn that has six, actually, okay? Now this is a rare feature. This feature was found, anybody was here three years ago, on Easton Road when we had the barn tour then, went to the uh, Lawbach barn, and this and that uh, Lawbach barn actually had one of these side bay or end bay or mow area longitudinal passageways that went from the mousehead wall all the way to the end wall. It's about seven and a half feet wide. It could have been used for general storage, but it's a very rare feature. I've only ever seen a few of those barns, okay? And here is the mousestead wall. There's probably about 40 or 50 percent of the one wall, anyway, that's intact. This is not pine, it's not oak, which we see 90 percent of the time or more. This is either walnut or basswood, and it's probably walnut rather than basswood, because, ba uh, I'm sorry, not basswood, uh, tulip wood. It's probably, I'll repeat that, it's probably either tulip wood or walnut, and more likely walnut because that, because to a foot, was so uh, su subjected to powder post beetle. And this hardly has any of that, okay? But we see that every once in a while, okay? This barn, by the way, is 60 feet, six inches. Anybody recognize that uh, distance? It's from Pitcher's Mountain to Home Plate. It was not 60 feet, not 61, but 60 
as Roger said, 60.5. Okay, um, and here we have the principal rafter system again, the common rafters, large principal rafters in line with the bed. There we see the, uh, the uh, built-in ladder, the upper tie beam, and the lower uh, tie, okay? Here we go on to the coffee barn. This is off Lower Salkin Road. It's only 32 by 28, but it's a, a very interesting barn. Here you have Pylorex on either side. I think the siding, the vertical siding on the far end, which is toward the house, in this case, I'm sorry, the near end, has the original siding. Here we have three original stable wall doors that are all blue, faded, faded, blue, faded, faded blue, I'm sorry, faded blue, and um, they're all original. There are no Spriggle Bar. You Spriggle Bar fans are going to be disappointed with this year's tour because none of the barns have any Spriggle Bar. The Spriggle Bars. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay? Here is the backside of a, an original door. One of the general dating tools of a barn, now there are exceptions to this, is look at how many boards there are. There's one, two, three, four, five. Normally, you would not see that on a pre-1830 or perhaps pre-1840 barn. You'd see sometimes two, uh, sometimes three or four. But that's a general way thing. When you see that and the boards are narrow, like on the mousehead wall, you can generally guess that it's going to be probably after about 1850 or 60. Okay? And here we see this very great uh, tradition of regionalism in our valley here, where the the summer, I'm sorry, the joists over the stable wall uh, can let her out beyond the wall by about four and a half feet in this barn, and they tend into the sill right here. You don't see that three or four miles, only to the, to the west. In my area, in McCutcheon, in Lehigh County, you never see this kind of feature. You see this in New Jersey, and you see it out in Ohio, but you don't see it in the Lehigh Valley. You see it extensively in the Salton Valley. Okay? Here's the one single summer beam. It's a 32 foot long timber minus the thickness of the walls. So there's no splice in this, just one beam. Okay? And here, of course, is the interior where we again we have our candid queen post, a diagnostic feature, candid uh, purling plates. If you have one member that's candid here, you have the other one that's candid virtually all the time. Upper tie beam, built in ladder. Okay? And you have marriage marks again, okay? All right? And you have again the overdead beams, all right? <laughs> this is the Rook or the Nelson barn that is also off Lower Salton Road. This is a 45 by 35 foot barn. These are two additions on the right hand side. We're not going to be going into those at all today, but we will be able to see all of this barn has all of its original stable wall doors, okay? Here we see, again, the stable wall doors here. Go ahead. This is the, this is the stable wall here, the inside. Here's the curry box and the in, uh, beam inset into the stone with the empty holes for the, for the harness of pegs. This is on the fourth side, of uh, the house side of the barn, for the horse stable. Okay? This is the end wall on the basement level toward the house. Now this door is unusual in that, you will see this today, this door is unusual in that it's centered, or just about centered, on the wall where most often the doors that are on the, on the, end, on the near wall near the house are set far back on the, toward the corner. It could be anywhere from as little as about three feet to maybe eight feet. Here it's centered. Here you don't see it very well because of the lighting and all that business. But here, from this point diagonally over to the left, is a flush wall with their stone. But here it's not because, as Bob says, they they built the wall, they dug out the trench, the earth, and just threw the um, stones in that wall. And these stones project four to six inches beyond that. There was no reason to make this really pretty or nice, and that's the way they did. So that was covered with, with, with earth or ground uh, before it was taken away 
to build the additions on the other side. The other end, the other end wall at the base of the level also has this uh, steepness of uh, ground level, okay? And here we have the Leidig barn. This is off Wassergoss Road. Wonderful little barn, 35 by 30. Here we have two faded barn stars, the owner, Jill Durstein, paint, have this barn painted, I don't know when, five or 10 years ago, but she knew enough, I guess intuitively or whatever, not to paint the barn stars, and that was smart of her. Let's go to the next one. And presto, my God, it was quick. Actually, Patrick Dunmore and his sidekick, Eric Claypool, painted this, I think, the last week in July. And uh, whirling swastika, they were only up there for a few hours, far, far less more complex than other barn stars that they've both done. Here we have a barn that is 35 by 30, a three-bay barn, frame standard barn, with all four of its original stable wall doors, a pile of about five feet, that's pretty wide for a small barn like that, okay? Here is the close-up of the barn star, okay? And here's another shot of the stable wall. These windows, by the way, are not original. And that's fading quickly. Um, these windows in the upper parts of the, of the doors are not original. I'd like to know if any of these doors ever have original upper windows. Sometimes those windows are filled in, okay? This is a mystery. This whole, beside it, Bob and I have been talking about that and Patrick too, for a while. We don't know really what it is. A couple suggestions have been made. Um, there was a barn that only came up about two months ago, a month and a half ago, out in Franklin County that had this. So we thought this was a unique barn, and it's not. There is at least one other barn that has that, okay? And here, we're on the inside of the barn. I'm sorry, this is not a real good photograph. This is the uh, original Mousestead wall. Bob, your pointer is unpointing. Uh, here's the original uh, side of the granary. And the door on the right-hand side, look on the upper right-hand corner of the door, there is, a, I'm sure, a wall. Door? Hey, there you go. Um, anyway, um, when you're in this barn, it's off of Wasserman House Road, look at the original hinge and look at the <coughs> attachment side, and it's a very fanciful, almost Arabian white uh, finish here. This is another dating tool. Look at the narrow, narrow aspect of all the boards. You would not find this in an 1810, 20, 30, 40 barn even. And the, the, the uh, hinge is connected to the front via um, bolts. I'm sorry, the bolts are, are, have screws on the end of it. You would never see that in an 18, a pre-1830 or 1840 barn, okay? And this, of course, is the upper area of the barn. Mill rafters, I think they're pegged. Again, we have the candy queen post. All these barns are late, so we're gonna have candy queen posts normally. There are exceptions to that. Here we have this timber right here. You can look at this when you're in the barn. This is an upper longitudinal tie. Not all the barns have this. One of the barns, I think it's the uh, Pitchell barn, has two of these on the end bow or the end bay. Here you have one. Here you have one, okay? And look at these craziness of the, of, the, of the marriage marks. They didn't forget them on all those. And they're consistent too. You have the one set, one set, and you have the one set and the other set, okay? This is some original exterior some vertical siding on the house side of the barn. We don't see <coughs> Pennsylvania hearts all that much. We see other forms of ventilation, okay? Now I'm gonna introduce you to a very special member of this household. <laughs> this is a very sweet dog, and this is great. He is the official mascot of not only the live of Hurston French Standard Barn, but of the entire tour. <laughs> okay. This is one, to me, this is one of the wonders of, of the of barn architecture in the greater Salton Valley, and as far as I'm concerned, the Southeast Pennsylvania. It's only a two-bay barn. Bob is looking at this barn probably in July, or August of last year, he, he goes by, it's a, he knew it was a two-day barn, I think he called it a two-thirds barn or something like that. Um, but he got permission for it to be on the tour this year, 
And this is only a two-bay barn. Here are the winnowing doors. Now, why would winnowing doors that you virtually always see in the middle of the barn, middle of the four-bay wall, to the side? You see it because this is only a two-bay barn. You have the wagon bay, I'm sorry, the wagon bay right here on this side, and on this side you have the end now. All right, so that is why the winnowing door is placed there. And again, we have Pylorex. Again, we have all three stable wall doors, original stable wall doors. You've got a six foot separation between the door on the left and the door, the next door, and, a, and less than a two foot separation over here. Now, why would you have that distinct difference there? It reflects the floor plan on the inside of the basement. That's why you have that, okay? And here's the two foot separation. And there you have the six foot separation between the other two barns. And you do have, again, one of those uh, window cutouts. These have been filled in uh, after the fact, okay? Now look at this crazy, crazy structure. My gosh. I went in there with Bob and Priscilla uh, about a week or so, maybe after the tour last year. We have a principal rafter system. This barn is only 24 feet by 24 feet. It is the smallest barn of any of the tours in the last eight years, okay? Why would you, for a 24 by 24, it's like a big shed, why would you put these massive uh, trusses, no, I'm sorry, not trusses, but uh, principal raft repairs in such a, well, we can't go back 150 to 175 years ago and ask them, but there's a lot of implications in that, and that's why I'm saying that this barn was very much uh, over-engineered, um, it's nice to have all these big timbers. Here you have three bed. This is the bed on the end. On the end wall, this this crazy uh, oak timber is a foot across. You know, you don't need that kind of support. And I've never seen, I've been in several two-bay, four-bay barns, you never see that kind of uh, timbering, okay? This is the other third wonder of the, of this uh, Marrick barn. Look at, look, this is the overhead, of course. You have three overhead beams. And the original, I, I can almost guarantee you that these that this, these boards up above, above which were form, were stored farm crops, that you have, and that you have these very wide, more than two feet wide boards. They, I would bet that they were probably chestnut. They could be walnut. They could be. I don't think they're oak. The grain is not right. It could be uh, tulip wood, but I think they're probably chestnut. Okay. And here again, we have a very clear view of this the back corner of the barn. Here we have an easel fuss, which we've talked about before. It's in your barn tour guide booklet. You have an easel fuss connection up here, where you have an upper tenon that, the, that is received into the upper tie, and you have a lower tenon that's received into the wall plate that sits atop the, uh, the uh, side wall, okay? And Bob, Bob uh, couldn't resist buying this. Uh, Bob, do you want to tell you a little story on that? Sure. My son found this at a yard sale. He, he, you know, he had a barn nut, so he bought this thing. It turns out to be a whiskey bottle. <laughs> you, can take, you can take off the lid, and there's a spout and a stopper there. Well, that was nice, and then the front <clears throat> point that says Mitchell's Whiskey. Now, Mitchell's Whiskey was made near Shaverstown, Pennsylvania. My mother happened to have been born in Shaverstown, in the Lawrence House, in 1892, I believe. And her family, the Bumbergers, were partners with the Mitchell's in this brewery business. So, uh, <clears throat> the Bumbergers lost out, they lost all their money, Victors kept on, and uh, they eventually began to produce these uh, collectible bottles. They're about what? How many does it say? This is number 3,000. 3,000 were made, and that's all. Limited edition. But it was a four bay bag form, a standard form, and uh, with my family connection, and her name is Bumberger, I call this the Bumberger Booze Farm. <laughs> Bob, you know, Bob is a really good uh, talker, speaker, lecturer, and everything. Again, he did the same thing today, just now, that he did fr uh, Thursday evening. He never said anything about the pile of Can you believe this guy? Anyway, actually, it doesn't have a pile of records. 
it has a, a, a angle which is rare, unique, than anything. It's, it's a, but it does have a forehead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. And last but not least, we have another look at three. Now, who, who can guess what MFB is? My best friend. No, man's best friend. <laughs> okay, we'll see three later. Thank you, everybody. Now